Ghana, are you ready? Easy. One of the you know people them that really stood for this. Easy. You understand me? And they made it work. Easy. From that time till now. Easy. Ladies and gentlemen. Easy. We're talking about the one named June Carroll Lodge. Easy. Born on December 1st, 1958. Easy. In London, England. Easy. Born to a Jamaican father and English mother. Easy. Ladies and gentlemen, talking about age-wise, this particular year, she will be 64 years young. Easy. Let's put our hands together and welcome the one and only JC Lodge. Easy. Hello there. <laughs> Hello. Blessings. <laughs> Are you hearing me? I, I'm, I'm, I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Nice. All right. How are you doing, JC? I, I am doing so well. Thank you so much, Lagazi. I'm enjoying the show. I see how you keep fit. You don't need to go to the gym. You just do your show. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to go to the gym, JC. No. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. Jesse, Jesse, trust me. I, I am wondering. You, you'll be 64 this year and you're still performing so hard. The energy you put into your performance, sometimes I wonder. What exactly has been keeping you all these years? Tell us. Well, it's not drugs, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. It's um, <laughs> probably, probably just good living, you know, eating healthy food. I do have unhealthy food as well because I love fresh cream and chocolate and things like that. But I do eat healthy food mostly. And um, I don't go to the gym, but I do like to walk and I like to dance. Well, I don't do that as often as I'd like. Wow. You know? Wow. So, so in terms of eating healthy, what and yeah. what do you eat in terms of eating healthy? If you can put us, you know, in camera so that we know that, all right, Jesse has been feeding on this so that some of us too can feeding. follow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. First, I should say greetings, Ghana, Blessings. and greetings to all all listeners. You know, it's Blessings. great to be here. Blessings. But um, in terms of what I feed on, uh, I, I guess um, in the morning I don't eat a lot. When I wake up, my stomach takes a long time to feel the need to have food in it, so I'll just have something hot to drink, and um, then later on, then I'll have some cereal like oats and granola and things like that with skimmed milk. Wow. And but the things that I snack on are fattening, but good for you. So I love nuts. I can't do it without nuts. Every day I eat nuts, a mixture of nuts, salty and unsalted mixed together, and a variety of different nuts. And another thing I have every day is plantain chips. I don't know if those are popular in Ghana. I know you have them, but mm -hmm. I don't know how popular they are. But for me, that's a number one food, plantain chips. And again, we have lots of different flavors. I can promote Grace <laughs> Grace brand, is a Jamaican brand. Okay. They have so many different flavors of plants and chips, and I mix them all together. So you get the salty with the unsalty and the chili with the paprika and the sweet ones. And, you know, just a nice mix. Um, eat that every day. Okay. And I, yeah, and in terms of meat, I, I eat um, lots of fish and things like that. I do eat other meats as well. I think um, a lot of countries in Africa, people love meat, don't they? That's the mm -hmm. that's the feeling I get because where I live in London, there are some Africans around from different parts of Africa, and um, yeah, they they've told me that they are they love meat. So is that so? Um, well, people love meat, but to me, I am doing away with meat. You understand me? I don't I remember know. the last time I I I took meat. Yes, you know. Wow. Body structure okay. wise, I'm always like this. The more I, you know, the more I hit the gym and all that, 
if you see me, you will not recognize me. So now I've I've just toned down and I'm just taking it easy on myself. You know what I mean? Easy. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. If you can do without meat, that's great. But mm -hmm. then you have to make up for certain like B vitamins. I think if you're not having meats, you have to Definitely. make sure you get like a B12. You know, from um, what do you get it from? Spinach and greens and mushrooms and things like that. Definitely. Definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, we're live with Jesse Lodge, hey. all the way from the UK. Which which part of the UK exactly are we talking to you from right now? Well, I'm in West London. West London. All right. Hey. Exactly three minutes gone into the R2 here on Assassin Radio. Hey. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you want... To ask Jesse any question, please do well and type it on the live. You understand me? Yes, type it on Asase 99.5, the live. And then I'll read it out to Jesse. Easy. And please make sure you share the link. Don't be greedy to yourself. I keep telling you this. Don't be greedy to yourself. Share the link. Easy. Now, Jesse, let's talk about um you growing up born to a jamaican father and an english you know mother growing up in the uk and from the uk to jamaica you know that story who would like to know how was it like yes well um as you say i started out in london mm -hmm. to, uh, my as you said dad was jamaican my mother was english they were only together three years though um mm -hmm. so when she left, I was with my dad alone and he had fostered me out to live with an English family so that I could go to school. And so I stayed with dad on weekends and holidays. Mm -hmm. And I think by the time I got to 10, it became increasingly difficult for dad to cope with me because when I was with dad, we were living in one, a one room um, flat in, in a, a house mm -hmm. um, with some other Caribbean people, mm -hmm. a Caribbean family. And uh, yeah, so I think it got too difficult. And he told me that we were going to Jamaica for a holiday and I was so excited. And he told everybody in London that had anything to do with me, my foster family, everybody that we were going on holiday to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> and this was in just December, 1968. Wow. And then I remember getting a bad cold while I was there. And then dad said, okay, he's got to go back to London. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, but you're going to stay with your auntie, that's his sister, mm -hmm. and her children. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be without my dad, you know. He yeah. was the main figure in my life. And nobody said, it's best for you and, you know, you're going to love it here. And I was like, no. And with this cold and him leaving, it was like the, the lowest point of my life, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember holding onto his shirt at the airport and crying my heart out. And off he went back to London and I stayed with my aunts and my cousins and my grandparents. And, you know, so it was very traumatic at first. But um, eventually, you know, I, I came to grips <laughs> with the fact that, OK, this is my new home mm -hmm. and very different from London. You know, everything was different. The weather, the food, the music, you know, the, the mm -hmm. way they spoke. I remember when I, the first school I was put in at break time, the children used to gather around me and say, Say something now, say something to cutie, <laughs> talk cutie, you know, because that sounded so so different to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a very a, a gradual getting used to a completely different um, environment, but I grew to love it. I grew to love the food, the music, the, the people, and, you know, so I stayed there 33 years. Wow. So that shows, that shows that, you know, I settled in, and that's where I began my music career. Okay, so um, before we step into music, being in Jamaica for 33 good years, wow, wow. 1968, visiting Jamaica, and she stood there for 33 good years. Easy. Now, how, how was it like? I know you said it was dramatic, living with your auntie and other you know, family members and all that. But in terms, you you coming from the UK to Jamaica, can you outline some of the problems you face at the early stage 
in terms of being with them, going to school, and people gathering around you, telling you, say something now, say something now. <laughs> <laughs> Can you outline some of the problems you faced around that particular time? Well, uh, funny. Well, in England, when I was growing up in England, I faced mm -hmm. some racism because um, th at that time in the early 60s, mid 60s, to late 60s, there, there was a lot of racism and there weren't very many mixed race mm -hmm. people, you know, mm -hmm. because it was frowned on to have blacks mixing with whites. Okay. So I had the racism in London of being, oh, you know, you're black and you're you're dirty or you're, you're not as nice as the white children kind of thing. Uh, at, at school, I experienced that, that quite a bit. And when I went out on the street with my foster sister, she was an older sister. She used to, she told me that she had to defend me all the time, you know, because people would cast these um, racial slurs at me. Mm -hmm. Then then going to Jamaica now, it was the opposite because then, you know, I seemed like a white person to, to Jamaicans, <laughs> to some Jamaicans, See. you know. So that, yeah, so you'd get whitey and all this kind of thing. But um, it was mixed, you know, in Jamaica. You, you mm -hmm. have the people that would look up to you because they thought you were white and what? pretty white lady and things like that mm -hmm. and then you'd oh, and then you'd have the other extreme of you know gray white gray a white woman you know mm -hmm. so it made you you had to be very what a thick skinned and um just accepting that people have based on their upbringing and what they've been exposed to they have different outlooks and it's for you to show them that you are very similar to them in many ways, you know, and that we also have differences. And the thing to do is to just accept people's differences and embrace them. Wow. So, wow. so that was one of the things. Wow. Yeah, that was one of the things. Mm -hmm. um, what else did I experience that was different? Um, I saw a well, mm -hmm. the, the music scene. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up in England, I was very much into pop music at the, the pop music of that time which would have mm -hmm. been you know the Beatles the Stones and all sorts of British acts um that I loved mainly the Beatles that, that was my number one group and then dad had a wide collection of jazz and blues music mm -hmm. so as well as as well as Jamaican music so I had a good um exposure to that as well and I had my jazz favorites even as a child Mm -hmm. Then going over to Jamaica, uh, listening to Jamaican radio, Jamaican radio at that time, I don't know what it's like now because we left Jamaica in 2001. But when I was growing up there and living there, you know, Jamaican radio exposed you to every music form, you know. So I got heavily into R&B. We had country and Western, mm -hmm. you know, and then all the Jamaican music. And even though it, sometimes it's called all of it is called reggae. Mm -hmm. There's so many genres within <coughs> reggae, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So you get a really good, a wide exposure to music listening to Jamaican radio. So my ears really got, you know, uh, a lot of exposure to um, different music forms. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what has helped to give me the foundation I have where I, I can love lots of different types of music. Okay. And be, com and be comfortable working with them. Mm. All right. All right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're having one on one with JC Lloyd. Easy. On Asasi Radio. Asasi Radio. Yes. So, now, in terms of music now, how, you, you, how did you discover your, your talent in terms of you, you know, being able to sing that sweet style? How how did you discover that at the early you know stage? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that recently because I hadn't really thought of when I actually started singing, and I think what I've come to the conclusion of is that when in England I used to sing along to the music I heard, the pop, the jazz, the blues, and so forth, but just to myself. And Dad never really said anything to me. Mm -hmm. um, about being that he thought I was musical in any way. He had a good singing voice. He didn't. He didn't really use it because when he was a a teen in Jamaica, he entered a, 
he entered a competition, mm -hmm. um, a talent show. Mm -hmm. And um, when he got on stage, he, he froze. He couldn't remember the words to the song. So that was the beginning and end of his career as a singer. Um, so, you know, I don't think he took it. Uh, he didn't see it as something that he could have been successful with. And therefore, I think he didn't entertain that thought for his child. I was his only child. In Jamaica, though, um, going to high school, mm -hmm. I used to sing at school a lot. And the, my schoolmates would say, oh, you, sound just, you sound just like a radio, you know, sing this song, sing that song. And I would do that in the class, which mm -hmm. was not what I was supposed to be doing. And they liked it so much that they would push me to go on to our, you know, any any uh, shows that we had at school, any any presentations. Mm -hmm. And I was I was reluctant because I was always very shy, mm -hmm. but they they insisted, so I did it, you know. And um, but I never felt comfortable singing on stage at that point. I was I was very comfortable acting. I did I did some acting, and for some reason that was fine. I wasn't so. I didn't feel so put on the spot because you, your lines were rehearsed and all that. But with singing, I, somehow it felt different. I felt more vulnerable, more more showing myself, you know. Okay. But um, then, while still in high school, I went on to sixth form, and it's in first year six. Mm -hmm. I met somebody called Errol, who is still in my life. Wow! Easy. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> From them, <laughs> from them time there to know. Right? Easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of tolerance. Definitely. A lot of tolerance there. Definitely. On both, on both our parts. Definitely. Yes. So, yeah, meeting Errol, Errol was, um, Errol loved to write and mm -hmm. he had written some songs and he said to me, you know, I've heard you singing, you can sing, I can't. Can you put my songs on a cassette so that we could? present them to people in the industry in mm -hmm. Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So between the two of us, we did it just at home, him banging out the beats on the table, me singing on one cassette, then we bounced it onto another machine so I could put harmonies on. I just had a natural ability to do harmony. Okay. And then eventually we presented that to various people in the music industry in Jamaica mm -hmm. till eventually it ended up at joe gibbs studio after mm -hmm. a long a long time i'm making the story very short yeah um and you know so that's how i that's how i got into singing professionally um it was never something that i thought of doing you know before that point i had never thought yeah i'm gonna go out there and become a singer because i think because singing for me was just something i did to entertain myself mm -hmm to comfort myself just to sing along to songs that i loved was was an enjoyment you know i didn't see it as a career and uh maybe that's why i developed a softer voice so i sing in a falsetto which is not what most people use mm -hmm. and um so that's maybe why you you would call that a sweet voice it sounds softer than, than many other um vocalists because mm -hmm. it is a falsetto voice and then i use my natural voice um, to just kind of flavor the falsetto, whereas most people sing in a natural voice and use falsetto as a flavoring. So it gives me a different sound. Not intentional, because to be honest, I wouldn't mind if I had developed my natural voice better so that I'd have a stronger voice. But that's how it has worked out, and I've stuck with it. And people have enjoyed it over the years, so there's no reason for me to try and change it now. Mm -hmm. All right. Easy. <laughs> We will come to the part where you met Ero and and up to now you guys are still together. Easy. Yeah. Now, those days in Jamaica, if you follow the history properly, it tells you that producers normally tells you that oh, um, you can send in your own song, but they will tell you that yo, I want you to sing this cover. I want you <laughs> to, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. In terms of meeting Joe Gibbs. Um, what exact, what materials did you and Errol, you know, present to him that he accepted to work, you know, with you? Well, some of the songs I remember on that cassette that ended up on the first album I did for Joe Gibbs were um, Stay In Tonight, Stalemates, and Pushover. Mm -hmm. So those were three of Errol's originals. But when we presented the cassette, it was E.T., Errol Thompson, who was the chief engineer and 
Joe Gibbs co-produced them mm-hmm. at the time. Um, he was the one that took the cassette from us. And then it was weeks and weeks and weeks before he came back to us with it, mm-hmm. you know, asking who had sung the songs on the cassette. And then I said, well, that, that was me. And then he said, okay, we want to do something with you. And as he said, Legacy, like, he didn't say, you know, we're going to do these songs on the cassette. He said, we have a tune for you to do, you know, mm-hmm. which wasn't the intention. We were always pushing the original material. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you're being given an opening, you know, and you, you know, I, I, it wasn't the point where we would have put our foot down and said, well, no, you know, this is what we want to do, the material on this cassette. So we went along open-minded to hear what they were suggesting. And the very first song that they presented to me was Do That To Me One More Time, which was made popular by Captain and Tennille. I think, I think they wrote it. Uh, but that song was only released in the Bahamas, so we never heard it. And um, nothing came of it, but eventually they came back to us and said, you know, we have another song for you to do. So maybe that was like a, a trial run, you know, that very first song. So the second song that they presented was Someone Loves You, Honey which was already popular in Jamaica, mm-hmm. being sung by Charlie Pride, who, mm-hmm. who, wasn't, who was not the writer. It was um, Don Davini was mm-hmm. the writer. Okay. So, yeah, so I recorded that song. And I remember, you know, being In which year nervous. was that? That yeah. was 1980. In, uh, um, 1980s. Sometime in mid-1980, maybe, because it was months before that song came out. It came out in September 1980, because I remember Errol and I kept on wondering, when is this tune going to come out, you know? And we were listening to the radio regularly to see if we, you know, heard it. And uh, then eventually, yeah, eventually that came out, and it was a huge success, and we just never anticipated that kind of success. It just blew us away. And I I don't know if Joe Gibbs expected it either, Um, but yeah, it took off. It was number one in all on all the charts in Jamaica, and it went overseas. And it was popular in various countries. It became song of the year in the Netherlands in 1981 to 82. Mm-hmm. It became gold and platinum in the Netherlands as well. So it really took us by surprise. And um, yes, yeah, so that was my start <laughs> that all was right. a very encouraging start all right so but as you but as you say you know this mm-hmm. is what they do they always push for cover songs mm-hmm. especially for females i think well back in that time they did mm-hmm. you know and i think it was a, a lack of confidence in us a lack of confidence they just wanted to go with more of a sure thing a song that they already know was you know well accepted you know, then there's less of a risk, I think, to do a reggae version of it. I think that's how it was seen. Oh, okay. All right. So mm-hmm. I I um I wanted to ask why do you think in those days um producers would rather push for you know push for artists to sing cover songs more than the original songs? And and as you said, it was lack of confidence on the part of the females around that time, right? Yes, and and I think um, not just the females. I think that in general, producers are mm-hmm. taking a risk with their investment, and you know, like any businessman, because a lot of them are really just businessmen. They're not even particularly musical. Mm-hmm. Some some are, you know. You know mm-hmm. Easy. A lot of of business people mm-hmm. they want to make their money back and make lots on top of it mm-hmm. so instead of going with a, an unknown entity you know you've given me an original song i don't know if people are gonna like this tune i'd rather go with a song that you know has already been out on the market that you've seen that people love it so you know there's less i think they see it as less of a risk i think that's why they do it all right so around that particular time you know yeah recording this particular song in the 1980s, like from the 70s to the 80s, where you recorded or you voiced Someone Loves You, Honey. Um, which which artists, in terms of your peers, who and who were around in Jamaica that time? Well, so the only experience we had, Errol and I, were going to Joe Gibbs' studio because mm-hmm. that's where we have been directed to. So at that time, you know, of course, Dennis Brown was around there a lot. 
Michigan and Smiley, um, Jennifer Lara, Marcia Aiken, um, um, Gregory Isaacs, uh, Tam Lins. Uh, I'd have to think a bit deeper on it, but yeah. you know, they're, they're, these are the people that we were seeing around there a lot. Yeah. And yeah, so. All right. So, so how was it like? Was it um, like a like a competition? Was it like a competition between, you know, um, you and your peers around that time, or it was like a free flow where all of you, you know, were doing all these things together? Uh, it it was competitive in the sense that there was always a line of people waiting to be seen, to be auditioned. You know, that, that's why it took us months for to even be spoken to by E.T. after we handed in the cassette. There were always so many people hanging around in the yard waiting for an opportunity to either sing something live to E.T. or give them a tape or something like that. So that was competitive. You know, were you going to get seen this week or were you going to have to come back the following week or the next month or, you know, in terms of um, that sort of thing, it was competitive. But once you got your in... Mm -hmm. um then i don't think it was competitive because each person had their own sound nobody was trying to sound like another person mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. at that point i found that the people's the, the it's like the producer wanted that uniqueness you know mm -hmm. they didn't want people to sound like oh yeah let me get that guy because he sounds just like this one you know and we've had success with that person they really wanted unique individual sounds, I think, at that time. From my experience, that's how it seemed, you know? So not competitive in that way. All right. Easy. Ladies and gentlemen, one-on-one -on -one with Jesse Lodge, all the way from the UK. Easy. On Asasi Radio. Easy. I would like to say big respect to my people that inside Kumasi on 98.5. Cape Coast on 100.3. Tamale on 99.7. And if you are a reggae addict and also lovers rock addict like myself, Easy. then I know you're going to enjoy this. Easy. Yes. Because we're talking to one of the pioneers. You understand me? Those days in Jamaica, you have to go and wait in front of the recording studio. Like weeks, like months, like years. And you every day you have to go there and try until yeah. someone will call you that you'll come. When when they send you and you go buy the thing or the stuff and you come and you enter, then you can tell them that you're listening, me can sing, you know. Me can sing. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. and then they will tell you that all right, sing a thing, no? Yeah. And, and when you are good, it means that you are going to be taken. So I understood what she was saying, the struggle she had to go through. You know, presenting the cassette to even Joe Gibbs, it took them months, right? Yes. Months for them to be called upon. Easy. Yeah. And trust me, those days too, when you go, they will tell you that, yo, listen, I think you have your own song, but I think, do a cover of this song. It's a hit song. Yeah. You understand me? They will tell yeah. you what to do. You understand? Yes. So it was no surprise that in the year 1980, how many of you were born by then? In the year 1980? <laughs> <laughs> in, in the year 1980, I wasn't born by then. Trust me. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Stop Seriously. showing up. Stop showing up. <laughs> I saw Syria. Yeah, so people, this is serious. It's something that, you know, when you read on the internet, they've written a lot of things, but we are hearing it from the lioness mouth. You understand me? Telling us how the story looked like on a sassy radio. A sassy radio. Now, in terms of um, getting a hit now, I want to find out from you whether around that particular time, like from the 70s um, to the early 80s, were there sound systems that you go out in the night and you go to the dance and you sing over there or it was strictly studio vibes around that particular time that 
you know, make artists popular and all that? DJs were around going to the sound systems and singing over tracks, definitely. Yes, there, there were, but I, I wouldn't have been doing that because remember, I didn't plan on a career in music, so I, I was not involved in music before that cassette was handed in. And um, I was also a very sheltered child growing up in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed out very much. So I wasn't at any dance. I could hardly get to go to parties. You know, I had to ask way in advance and be on my best behavior. And if I did anything, my aunt would say, no, well, that's it. You're not going to that party and that's it. So I was hardly out. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, a very restricted kind of life, really. Um, so, yeah, for me, I wasn't involved with a lot of the artists and so forth. So sometimes, like, I had a, I had a, a I have a schoolmate mm -hmm. from my high school, mm -hmm. and she's now involved in radio. Mm -hmm. And every now and again, we communicate, or I see something she's written on Facebook, and she's got so many memories of different scenes that, you know, she hung out in and the people that she met and all that. And I think, where was I? I don't know any of these people because wow. I was, you know, my, my aunt was quite strict, so I didn't go out a lot, you know? Is it because but, is it because you were not allowed to go out because around that time you were that pretty woman that, you know, you, you, you caught the eye of every man. So, you know, um, um, your, your aunties were, were kind of scared that if you go out, something could have happened to you? Um, well, I think different different um, guardians mm -hmm. have different outlooks. My aunt was particularly strict. She was quite strict. And uh, I think that was just her way of making sure that nothing happened to me and that I stayed home and I, you know, did my studies and things like that. All right. So so, so if, if, if she was very strict on you, how did yeah. Errol, you know, made, you know, his way through? It was very difficult, <laughs> I tell you. Errol had to call and ask if he could come and visit. Wow. He was told when he could come by. He was told how long he could stay. And we were only allowed to sit on the veranda or just in the living room. And that that's it. Nowhere else. And, you know, she'd, <laughs> no. come, she'd come out and start clearing her throat and looking at her watch and saying, you know, come, come, come. Time is up now. That's it. Wow. <laughs> Easy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so the two of you couldn't even have a time to if you stay in the dark for a minute. Yeah, we had a, you know, we'd have a couple of hours. Same, same. Easy. Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thirty minutes going into the R two. Now, making the hit now. Someone loves you, honey. You know how 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 did your career turn? in terms of music? So, well, with the success of Someone Loves You, Honey, of course, Joe Gibbs started rubbing his hands, thinking, yes, man, I'm going to make something up for this woman now. <laughs> so, you know, he did, he did the album. Mm -hmm. Someone Loves You, Honey um, was the name of that album. And that's how we got our three tracks on there, because by then they were looking for material. They, they had some covers. Um, Joe Gibbs worked a lot with Willie Lindo as well. And mm -hmm. Willie is a writer, you know, guitarist, arranger, producer. Mm -hmm. So he got some tracks on there as well. And um, yeah, that was that was the start of that project. Um, the album did fairly well, but not as well as a single. And uh, then we moved on to work with Willie because we found Joe Gibbs to be Joe Gibbs was a very fatherly type of person that made you feel very comfortable and relaxed around him. But he was also um, just out for himself. You know, really, I'd have to say, just dishonest is, is, the, is the word I can, mm -hmm. I have to use for him, you know? I mean, the fact that he even had the label printed with his name as the writer mm -hmm. of Someone Loves You, Honey, mm -hmm. which got him into huge trouble. He was sued. He had to close his business, got himself into, you know, real, a real situation there with his dishonesty. Mm -hmm. And um, that dishonesty filtered down to us because, you know, we weren't properly paid. We never got, we never, never have been properly paid from 
Joe Gibbs music. So even to this day, whatever sales they have, we don't get anything off of that. Um, Now, are you telling me that the song Someone Loves You, Honey, yeah. which shot you into fame yeah. in the 80s, you, you, you didn't make nothing off it till now, to this day? He, he gave us a small advance when we did the album. Mm -hmm. I think it was something like 4,000 Jamaican or something like that at the time. I can't quite remember. But it was, I remember at the time, Errol and I thought, compared to what we were told by other people, it wasn't a great advance. But that's what you're being offered. You take it, you know. And But no royalties have been paid by Joe Gibbs. To date? To, to this day. Wow. To this day. Easy. No. And we're, we're not alone. I think anybody that worked for Joe Gibbs is, would be in the same bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So um, I would like to find out from you whether um, if you're not making money off it, I, I not have from sales, but at least we get to do live shows, you know? Okay. So it's not a complete loss. Okay. So yeah. it, it means that on your live shows and all that, you make money from performance and all that. Yes, from performance and quite a few dub plates, I might add. All right. All right. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Talking about dub plate, immediately I put your flyer out. Almost all the African sound systems were on my neck. And, <laughs> and I'm wondering, I'm not seeing Shashamani on the live. I'm not seeing Lion Paul on the live. Easy. Shashamani, Papa Bingi from Kenya, Lion Paul from South Africa. Easy. I don't see you guys on the live. Because you guys told me that Lagazi asked Jesse Lodge, why is she not giving Africans dot plate? And I'm like, <laughs> how, how, how am I going to say this? Easy. <laughs> How would I know who to reach out to to give dub plates to? They can find me. I can't find them. <laughs> <laughs> Now, is it is it expensive to cut Jesse Lodge on 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 dub? Not comparatively speaking, no. It's not. It's not too expensive. It's affordable. It's it aff is affordable. It's affordable. It is. Can you give us a range in terms of being affordable? Easy. Uh, I think we prefer to tell the individuals that call in because it depends on what they're asking for and it depends on how many tracks. So okay. I don't think I'm going to dis disclose that here on this format. All right. But Errol is a man. Errol is a man to talk to. Okay. And, you know, I can be contacted via, well, you, um, Facebook. Okay. You can find me on Facebook. Facebook, you can put JC Lodge fan page. Okay. You know, go right. into JC Lodge fan page and contact and send a message to Errol. All right. And he'll give you all the lowdowns because Errol is the man to deal with the business. All right. No problem. <laughs> all right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, this year, JC Lodge will be 64, young. Yeah, 64 years young. And look how pretty, you know, she is. And she's still <laughs> voicing Doc Pleat. Now, Um, if I may know from you, which sound system did you first voice a doublet for? Oh gosh, I can't remember that now. I know one of the early ones was Addis International, but I can't remember anymore from that. One of the you know, early ones human. was Addis International with uh, is it Danny Dread or Babyface? Babyface. Oh, Easy. that's my man. <laughs> Babyface. Yeah. Uh, you know, and recent, recently I did a track for him, you know, after all these years of, um, you know, he, he he formed his own sound system. Yeah. He's got Lion King music. Yeah. And he has his label, Lion King Music. And he approached us a few years ago to do a, a track, to mm -hmm. sing on a track that he produced, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did a song called Over. I don't know if you've heard that. Yeah. And it went, it went number one in New York. So wow. just over a year now. And, and, number and, one in New York. How how was it like working with um, Babyface? Oh, he's a cool guy. You know, he's a decent human being. And um, it was a very good rhythm. I really like that rhythm. Wow. And he tried his best to promote it well, you know. But I think if you're not, if you don't, if you're not super rich, it's very hard to push a track and 
and get people to play it. You know, you'll get some people playing it just because they love good music, but there are a lot of people who won't touch a track unless you are lining their pockets and it's not really affordable unless you're super rich or you've got some kind of contacts that, you know, influence them. So Lionface did a good job on promoting the tune as much as he could, and it went to number one in New York, but, you know, it, it didn't um, prog progress beyond that because it would have taken far more money than we had, you oh, know, so. All right. So, so now, um, I would like to know from you, being a yeah. female, right, in yes. terms of the struggle in this industry, I, I know it's not easy. And talking about Jesse Lodge, you can't talk about Lovers Rock, you understand me? And take out the name Jesse Lodge from it. That would be impossible, you understand me? So, all this while, in terms of your experience being part of the pioneers from the beginning, you know, pushing this vibe in terms of reggae and lovers and all that, looking at what females are going through, if you have the power to change something in this industry to favor females in terms of lovers, in terms of reggae, what exactly would you do? I'd like to see more parity. I, you know, when you look at the artists in R&B, mm -hmm. you don't have to be searching out the females. And, you know, if, if a DJ on radio is playing R&B, they play, I, I would say, equal amounts of male and female tracks. Yeah. You know, it is not male dominated. And I think that there would be far more females in the industry if we felt like we had a, a, a fair deal. Mm -hmm. I think things are very unbalanced. It's Jamaica is a male chauvinistic society, mm -hmm. you know, in general. And the music, the music scene has been treated in the same way. So there just have never been as many women. Um, the women are not played as much as the males. When there are shows, there aren't as many females on as males generally. You know, and you can see that for yourself. Yet, it is a society that is always boasting about how macho <laughs> we are, you know. And, you know, we fight down homosexuality. Yet, when we put um, a show together, it's male dominated. So explain that to me. If you are, you know, you're a man and you love women, why are most of the shows male dominated? Why is radio in general male dominated, male artist dominated? Somebody can call in and explain that to me. I don't get it. Where is this love of women that you claim to have? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <Crazy. laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in no time, we'll be wrapping up with Jesse Lloyd. But um, let me revisit um, this one. As I said earlier, on the 15th of this month, October, at the O2 Arena, trust me, there were 20, 27 artists on stage. Jesse had eight minutes and he, she did a whole album. <laughs> and... Trust me, um, JC, let me find out from you. How did you do that? And, you know, how how do you maintain the balance? You know what, Lagazine? Mm -hmm. In this, in my career over the years, mm -hmm. I have had a range of experiences with live performances. Mm -hmm. I've had quite a few shows where I've been given ample time to really relax on stage and enjoy my craft and give people a good show and expose them to you know material that i've done mm -hmm. and then at the other end of the spectrum i have also been told yeah five minutes just sing it them and i really resent that because after 42 years in the business and 14 albums it's very frustrating for an artist to be told you've got five minutes to show off yourself to give people something worthwhile so when I signed up for the Giants of Lovers Rock, I've done that show once before. Before I got 20 minutes, maybe I think the, um, the, the roster was less. There were less acts on that time. So this time 
as you said, there were quite a few acts, 27 or something like that in total. And the promoter told us from early, you've got eight minutes. Everybody's getting eight minutes. And I was like, oh, no, not another one of those shows. And Errol immediately said, right, well, I know what we're going to do. You're not going to go up and sing two songs because that's what most people know of you anyway. And we are not about this, you know, in this business for so long to keep on promoting two songs, two songs from way back when, when you have been consistently um, performing on tracks, new tracks and writing more and more and more. So he was the one that came up with the idea of editing as many tracks as we could fit that we thought people here in UK would recognize and would love. He edited our tracks together. We presented that to the band. And of course they were saying, wow, this is a lot of songs for your eight minutes. You know, mm -hmm. most people are doing one or two. We said, yes, we know, but you know, and I'll explain to them that this is what we're fighting. We're fighting against always singing two songs as if I'm an artist who just started last week and I only have two songs to my name. Mm -hmm. So the band accepted it and, you know, credit to them. They were very good musicians and they really worked at it. And they got that show together for me and we did it. And the promoter said afterwards, well done. He said, boy, you Easy. know, you're the first person he's seen. Do he said, you're the first, first person I've seen doing an album in eight minutes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. I saw a series of now, listen, 14 yeah. albums in 42 years of career yeah. span and still, you know, going strong and still moving strong. Wow. Easy. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for this platform to explain to people who are listening that I don't just have two hits or even just four or even just 10. I've got quite, I mean, I, I could say in my mind, I've got lots of, I've got like an hour's worth of hits, but it's hits that you missed. <laughs> wow. They haven't been given. They haven't been given the exposure to really become hits on a, on a radio station or on a, you know, on a, on a platform like that that people have heard. But if people got a chance to hear them, they would enjoy them. All right. I know they would. I think I think I've I've played a quite few. You know, like this particular month, I've played a lot of J C Lord. So. I, follow, I appreciate that. Yes, I really if, appreciate that. If you follow, be. if you follow this show, trust me, you must know where I go. On. <laughs> but have you toured Africa yet? I have never been to Africa. No country in Africa. Can you believe that? Wow. And it's mainly because, as an artist, you know, we are struggling people. We we don't usually take ourselves to a country and say, "Here I am. I want to do a show here." We usually wait for a promoter to invite us over. But the only way they're going to invite us over is if the people know our music and love it. Then they'll want to see you. Who's going to be asking for an artist whose material they've not heard? No one. Wow. And if they only know two songs, then you're not that much in demand, are you? Oh, yeah, that lady, she only had two songs. No, let's get somebody that we know 10 of their songs. <laughs> wow. That's how it is, reality. Wow. Anyway, it will happen. It will, we're working towards it. It will happen. We, we're not giving up. We keep on putting out good quality products. Sooner or later, somebody is going to give me that break I'm looking for. Easy. Mr. Jando, what you say? Programs director, Mr. Jando, what you say? Easy. JC, she's never been to Africa before. Easy. Big up God. Easy. On this one here. Where is a godfather? Easy. Uncle Kojo Bensa. Easy. In Shradu. Easy. <laughs> Yo, what the item say? Easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry Atiso says, Lagazi, you see the revelation about Joe Greed? Many reggae musicians has gone through the same experience um, go check out his encounter with Max Romeo. Easy. All right. Right. Mensa Kwabinama only says yard settings to the world, original, no carbon copy. Easy. Kojo Asempa Furniture Works says good afternoon to your listeners from Kojo Asempa uh, Furniture Works inside Edum Kumasi. Easy. A lot of big ups over here, but I don't see no question. Look like, Jesse, you've covered all the areas people wanted. Easy. 
But the only, thing is, the only thing is, she's never been to Africa before, so we'll work on something. You understand me? Yes. And we, yes. we will keep pushing the vibe over here. You understand me? Before I leave you finally, wow, 14 albums, 42 years in the business, and she's still strong. When you check out her YouTube page, uh, uh, page JC Lodge Music, you will see her perform eight minutes performance. And she did a whole album. Go, go and check out the energetic performance in terms of live band. Easy. Yo. Yo. Cho. Easy. Yo. Ghana, wake up. Africa, wake up. Easy. So, before I leave you, what, what sort of advice do you have? I'm, I'm, I'm much particular about our females in, in this side of the industry. The struggle they go through and all that. You, you have been, you know, at the forefront, you know, pioneering this, you know, from, you know, day one and all that. 42 years in the business, all this experience. What sort of advice do you have for our females in this side of the industry? Well, I get asked that question a lot and maybe my answer is not what you'd want to hear because I would not encourage a young woman who's interested in music I wouldn't say yeah man come into the reggae business because you know you can really make yourself a success you know you just work hard and you'll get there how can I say that you know it is such a struggle we're still struggling to this day to be heard you know so I could only say to them if you have that passion and you want to follow it, be prepared. It's a long, hard road. You may make 10 great songs and maybe one of them might get some exposure. That's the reality of it. And it's best if you hook yourself up with some people who have enough money to spend on you to promote because otherwise you'll just be making products and it's not going to get the exposure you need. That is it. That's what I would say, you know. And I've, I've said on a few um, interviews um, recently that there are a lot of um, really good young females coming out of Jamaica now doing reggae. They, I'm happy to say that they're doing original material. The productions are high quality. They're do doing good videos, you know, of a high quality as well. that can stand up to first world videos from any other country. And so I'm just watching them and seeing, you know, what's going to happen with these young females coming out with They've got a great look. You know, it's a full package. What's happening with them? Because they are going to be showing the world, you know, the results of hard work and good standards in reggae. As a female, this is what will happen for you. What's going to happen? Let's see. All right. Jay-Z, I would like to say thank you so much for your time and space. And I know this is not going to be the last. We are family now, please. All the necessary materials. Let us have them and let us be pushing them in Ghana. Legacy Sound International. All the crew, all of us, we are representing Jesse Lodge to the highest level. And I know Jesse also is going to represent us from where she is. Jesse, yes. thank you so much for your time and space. Thank you for having me. And don't forget my latest track called Love Uprising on the transfusion rhythm. Don't forget that it's out now. It's on an EP, um, you know, Luciano is on it, Pinchers, Wayne Armand. Give this track, give it a listen, give, it the, give the EP a listen, but listen to Love Uprising, my original track on that rhythm. All right. It's a positive message that we need now. Definitely. And, and yeah. finally, finally, your social media handles so that people can follow yes. you. Yes. Yes. So, you know, Spotify, you can always find my music on that. iTunes, YouTube, you just type JC Lodge Music, one word. Facebook, JC Lodge fan page. And Instagram, JC Lodge official. So you have it all there. I'm not hard to find. My material is all accessible. Go find it. Thank you so much for your time and space, Thank JC. You. All right. Easy. Thank you, Lazy. Thank you for the work you're doing. Well done. Blessings, blessings, Easy. blessings. This is Assassin Radio. We promised and we delivered. JC Lodge talking to us 
all the way from the UK and we give thanks. Easy. Let me play this one coming from Jesse Lodge. 